In this opening plenary of day two, we're going to be talking about revolutions in vaccination in the age of COVID-19. So yesterday we talked about the ethical challenges and we're continuing our journey of considering the lessons that have been learnt, the advances made and how they can be effectively integrated into public health responses in future crises. That's going to be the focus of our discussions here. I'm going to hand over to our moderators, but remember, if you have questions, please do get them coming in. I'm delighted to welcome on stage Eskide Scientific Committee members Adam Roth, who is head of the Fellowship Programme at ECDC, and Magdalena Rosinska, Professor from the National Institute of Health in Poland. Very warm welcome, Adam and Magdalena, and over to you. Well, thank you, Jackie. Um, and uh, welcome everyone to this morning's session of today and uh, hopefully we get an excellent and interactive session despite the um, early hour. Um, the vaccinations uh, have been with us for quite some time already and um, but we all feel uh, from our experience just as a public health professionals but also as citizens that a lot have happened uh, during this past two years. Uh, during the pandemic times. So with these sessions, we want to explore um, what exactly have happened, what are the novelties, uh, the innovations, but also what that means for the future. Um, so um, we have uh, three very good speakers and, and I'm really looking forward to, to the presentations. But before, uh, before I introduce them, I would just briefly um, ask you as audience uh, to, to be interactive, to share your experience from different countries, because I think we might share some experiences um, in this era of uh, vaccination and uh, we can have also different, vac uh, different experience. So it's important that we have these interactions. So without uh, any delay, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Hannah Nohinek. Um, Hannah uh, is a chief physician of infectious disease uh, control and vaccines uh, unit at the Finnish Institute uh, for Health and uh, uh, Welfare. And uh, she's also serving in many committees uh, for hepatitis B and rotavirus vaccines and also uh, was uh, greatly involved in HPV introduction in, um, in Finland. And she's also an uh, advisor in, uh, for EU, WHO and Gavi and a member of uh, WHO SAGE and the uh, chair of uh, WHO SAGE uh, COVID vaccination uh, committee and also um, a member um, of ECDC NITAC uh, Coordination Committee and the Finnish uh, NITAC and of course an active researcher in the field. So, uh, Hannah, please uh, take a seat. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we also have uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on the spot uh, with us uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Ward um, and he's a sociologist uh, from French National Institute uh, uh, of, uh, for Health and uh, Medical Research in CERN. Um, and uh, also a member of French, NITAC, and uh, who have been actively researching uh, mandates and, cert uh, and certificates uh, and their impact on uh, uh, vaccines, uh, vaccine acceptance uh, in France. And uh, we have also online Professor Cornelia Batch. Um, I don't know if we can, if we see the, uh, her or uh, later. Okay, uh, so Cornelia uh, is a psychologist and a Heisenberg Professor for Health Communication at uh, the University of uh, Erfurt. Um, and she's, she's uh, created a master's degree uh, at the university, yeah, uh, master's degree program uh, <coughs> uh, at, uh, for this name. Uh, but uh, um, she uh, has been very actively researching um, uh, COVID uh, acceptance attitudes, uh, running the, the COVID snapshot monitoring, COSMO study, um, uh, which was recording uh, uh, the sort of psychological uh, coronavirus situation, uh, for which she, she, got, she got numerous uh, prizes. And she's also uh, in the WHO technical advisor group in uh, uh, Be uh, Beharad uh, Council and, uh, for, for cultural insights and in, uh, Interdisciplinary Commission for Pandemic Research uh, in Germany. Uh, so, uh, we, would, uh, we would like to warmly welcome all the speakers and I will now pass uh, to my co-chair, Adam, to introduce uh, the topics of the sessions. Adam, please. 
Thank you very much, Magda, and uh, I'm, uh, welcome all uh, panelists and welcome everyone here. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and talk about this uh, field today. Just as Magda said, it's happened so much to this field uh, in the past two and a half years. It's almost unbelievable, and I think the revolution in itself, uh, th there is in partly a revolution. Uh, speaking personally, I was the head of the, the uh, immunization program uh, for, uh, for Sweden until uh, April two th 2020. And uh, that was just before all of this started. So if I would go back now to my previous job, uh, I think uh, there has been such a dramatic development uh, that, uh, that uh, it's, it's quite, quite amazing. And uh, today we'll have the privilege to discuss this from three different perspectives. Uh, first of all, the innovation itself, the mRNA COVID vaccine and the way it's been implemented worldwide, how, what implications this have and what may lie in the future. What, what are the um, possible uh, effects uh, that this new innovation will have for immunization programs and new possible vaccines. And then the second uh, perspective uh, will go more into the, uh, with our second speaker, more into the psychology of vaccination, how people identify uh, in, in, with, with being vaccinated and their vaccination status. This uh, may cause uh, polarization but, and, and has partly changed the social contract of vaccinations. And uh, perhaps we, from, from studying this, we'll give public health authorities new ways and, or new tools or possibilities in, in tackling uh, vaccine uh, or, or increasing vaccine readiness and vaccine acceptance. I think this is incredibly important perspective as well. And going to the third speaker, uh, we'll, we'll, in the context of France, uh, look at uh, and tackle the issues of uh, vaccine mandates and vaccine certificates and uh, how this has polarized or uh, politicized uh, vaccination in a, in a strong way. And uh, I hope we can uh, then sum it all up in, 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 a, in a good plenary discussion and get all these three perspectives together. And they also return to uh, part of the very important discussion we had at the introduction of uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, conference in the eth ethics seminar, ethics plenary where we have the intervention ladder and um, how critical it is that we review ethically the policies we have so that we can motivate uh, the costs of the policies, both for, for individual freedom and uh, societal costs. So uh, by that, I think we can start our session. And uh, I think we should, we'll start with, we have one poll for you, uh, only one, so be, be active on that one. I think we're gonna, we can start the poll now. And um, uh, what we're going to ask you is what you think uh, the, this new uh, revolution has meant and, and, and will mean in, for vaccine acceptance. So um, uh, we will have this question posed now. Um, and uh, uh, then we will return to the answer whilst, when, when we come back to, uh, to the plenary discussion. So you can keep on answering for a while. So in your view, would new mRNA vaccines, uh, uh, it's strangely worded there I see, new mRNA vaccines for COVID or other vaccines increase or decrease public acceptance for vaccination programs? Would it increase, decrease it or will it not affect it? So, I would also like to encourage you to continue posing uh, questions in, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the speakers. We will not interrupt in between the speakers uh, with, with questions, but we will take all questions towards the end. So, continue writing questions, please. With that, uh, I'd, I'd like to invite Johanna to the Thanks. first speak. Thanks a lot and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all of you. I, I saw uh, in the chat that there are some people even from Malaysia listening to us here. So the, the topic is very, very uh, joint and common. So I was asked to talk about the development of the COVID vaccines and especially the RNA vaccine uh, uh, development. But let me start um, from uh, what was very unique uh, in the COVID vaccine development landscape. Uh, as, as you know, um, uh, there was a great amount of uh, push uh, to get uh, vaccines uh, around. There was a new pathogen, there was uh, lots of deaths. And, and you can see that uh, uh, from the, 
uh, from the uh, start of the uh, opening of the genetic code uh, to all researchers January 11th, uh, actually it, it took uh, uh, 326 days for the first regulator to actually uh, give a, uh, um, a license uh, to the uh, very first vaccine, which was the RNA vaccine. But before we got there, uh, there really uh, was uh, a, a, a lot uh, that needed to be done. The, the ambition was 100 days and uh, the uh, collaboration of the public and private, the R&D monies that were uh, uh, brought in, uh, all of that uh, together with the rolling uh, uh, um, uh, assessment by the regulators actually made this possible. Uh, CEPI, uh, um, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness, they set the ambition 100 days and we all knew that that's you know, astronomic. How, how can you make it that fast? But actually even the 300 and plus days was quite amazing because usually if you look into on when uh, our vaccines from the start uh, of the inception, the concept to when we have a vaccine license usually takes about 10, 12 years. So this was really quite amazing in itself. The other amazing thing was that if you look into this landscape, how many products do we have in there? I mean, uh, over 300 uh, um, uh, candidate vaccines uh, have been uh, um, uh, uh, brought to the daylight. Of course, not all of those have uh, come to uh, the clinical development, uh, but uh, looking into on, on how many 34 actually being used on large scale, 12 have been dropped. And if you look into on which kind of vaccines are uh, being uh, uh, developed, they are, are plenty. Maybe the live attenuated vaccines are the least uh, uh, popular concept, but you can see that the protein adjuvanted vaccines and the, and the RNA vaccines really uh, rank high up there. That was from the London School. They have stopped uh, updating their landscape, but the WHO actually is updating the landscape uh, on a daily basis. And, and you can see here that among the vaccines uh, that are used the most, and, and develop the most uh, are the protein adjuvant vaccines and the RNA vaccines. So let's dive deeper into the RNA vaccines. What are those? And, and, the, and the beauty of that concept is that uh, actually you just insert the genetic code uh, into uh, 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 the uh, human being and the human being cells themselves start producing the vaccine antigen so that you don't need to go through the very tedious processes of uh, cleaning and, and uh, um, uh, quality assuring, but actually uh, uh, the um, body in itself uh, produces uh, the, the vaccine. And this concept is not new. I mean, uh, uh, RNA was uh, um, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, discovered in, in 1960s and, and then it took in 1990s to actually have the concept that this RNA could be used as a, a vaccine. And uh, when uh, there was an understanding that the RNA can actually stimulate T-cell memory and RNA can uh, also uh, uh, give elicit antibodies, then the uh, uh, road was uh, paved uh, so that um, uh, the, the concept of, of using RNA as vaccine uh, was started. The very first uh, discoveries didn't really lead to much anywhere. I mean, by the time that we started uh, uh, looking more detailed in the COVID RNA vaccine, there actually was only one RNA vaccine that had to come to the phase one stage. Uh, the, the breakthrough uh, that actually happened, and, and that's uh, thanks to Weizmann and, and, and uh, Katalin, uh, is, is that the nanoparticles uh, uh, were uh, uh, discovered as, as kind of safeguarding the RNA when it was uh, uh, taken uh, into, the, um, into the cell. And, and uh, the idea there was that uh, um, uh, Unlike previously, when the RNA was really uh, degraded uh, during its pathway uh, to the cells, uh, the lipid particle was protecting it so that actually uh, uh, most of the RNA did reach the cell and uh, the antigen production could start there. So this was uh, revolutionary also uh, um, from the uh, manufacturing point of view. All you need to do uh, is to uh, uh, produce the RNA, uh, uh, then uh, uh, clean it up, 
uh, and, and then uh, package it with the uh, lipid particles and uh, purify it and, and then uh, put it into the vials which we are now uh, using in our vaccination. Quite a different story in comparison uh, uh, to uh, what uh, producing these traditional vaccines means, uh, growing the uh, uh, virus or the bacterium, purifying uh, um, uh, uh, the components from there uh, and, and uh, uh, lots of quality assurance steps uh, and, and taking, taking months, if not years, uh, to come up, like let's say the pneumococcal uh, conjugate vaccine taking 24 months uh, in, its, in its manufacturing. So again, this enabled us uh, to have a vaccine very rapidly and, and uh, uh, starting the COVID vaccination. So, if you look into uh, in today's charts on, on how uh, these vaccines are being used, you can see uh, this data is from August, so it's somewhat obsolete, but uh, uh, still the uh, magnitudes of, of the differences between the vaccines are, are quite accurate. So, the uh, most used vaccine uh, in the world right now is still the adenovirus vectored uh, vaccine, but followed by the RNA vaccines. It looks quite a wealth of, of uh, uh, vaccines that we have uh, at our uh, um, uh, uh, hand. But then if you look into how these vaccines actually have been used in the world, and that's a far more dismal picture. Uh, looking into the uh, high income countries, the vaccine coverage, if you look into the doses per hundred uh, population, is, is really very high uh, 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 over uh, uh, four per hundred in, in places like Chile. Uh, um, and uh, most of the high-income countries having uh, three to four doses. Uh, and, and then if you look into the African and the other uh, um, uh, low-income countries, it's, it's quite dismal. And uh, this is what I would call the vac vaccine nationalism. We can discuss that in, in our panel on what it actually has meant to the spread of the virus, but that's the reality where we still are. Now, what do we know about uh, the uh, efficacy and effectiveness of these vaccines? It was really quite amazing to, to see the very first results from the RNA vaccines with the vaccine efficacy about 95%. And that still holds. If we look into uh, these vaccines in relation to one another, the RNA vaccines really uh, are uh, uh, ranking high, over 90% efficacy against a severe uh, uh, COVID disease. Then come the protein uh, uh, um, subunit adjuvanted vaccines, then come the adenovirus vectored vaccines, and then uh, come the inactivated vaccines. Um, if we look into the first data that was available to us, um, uh, these are the Pfizer and Moderna with their two dose effectiveness uh, uh, studies uh, during the alpha and delta period. You can see that during the alpha time, uh, regardless of the place where it was studied, uh, England, Scotland, uh, Canada, uh, Israel, Qatar, uh, the vaccine efficacy against severe disease was extremely high. <coughs> the vaccine against uh, symptomatic infection also was quite high uh, and uh, um, uh, somewhat lower uh, um, uh, uh, effectiveness uh, against infection. But the picture dramatically changed when there were new variants coming around the corner. Uh, with the Delta, one could already see that the uh, uh, efficacy against the uh, serious disease, that had remained very, very high. But the uh, effectiveness against the infection, meaning uh, um, uh, 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 blocking transmission, that really uh, 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 was uh, quite reduced. And the same story has now continued when we come to the Omicron period. The uh, effectiveness against the infection is even less. <coughs> so if I summarize on what we know uh, now about the effectiveness of COVID vaccines, we could say that the vaccine against a serious disease and death is excellent regardless of the variant of concern. And in, in that kind of a semantic graph, you can see that it, it really comes down very, very slowly over time. Vaccine uh, effectiveness against symptomatic disease is good, but uh, varies uh, according to the variant of concern. And then the vaccine against the infection and transmission is moderate and very short-lived uh, and wanes, uh, varies according to the variant of the concern. And this graph, uh, we in Finland, we had to draw uh, to our politicians and to our lay people so that they would fully understand on how these vaccines are excellent when we are thinking about the, uh, preventing the uh, uh, serious disease. But they are not so good if, if we want to block the transmission. 
And this, of course, has implications to your vaccine strategy. So, so uh, please remember this picture. I, I think it's really, really important. Now, more data came around and uh, then asking on, on what is the duration of protection after the, the first RNA vaccine booster dose. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Johns Hopkins data and WHO data. Johns Hopkins has got a beautiful uh, web page where you can actually look into uh, the different vaccine effectiveness studies being carried out in different parts of the world and the data is there and meta-analysis is being done. But uh, graphically, again, you can see uh, that when it was a question of the serious disease, uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness remains very high. When it's a symptomatic disease, it uh, 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 starts pretty high, but it comes down very rapidly. And then when you talk about infection, it starts somewhere in between and, and comes down really rapidly. So that uh, our picture has remained uh, even after the booster. So even if the booster uh, elicits antibodies, uh, yet uh, the duration of the antibodies uh, will not uh, remain that high, that long, uh, that they could prevent infection uh, um, uh, fully. So uh, what do we b know about the, um, uh, the uh, safety of these vaccines? And, and again, one busy slide where you can see uh, uh, the uh, uh, different uh, vaccine community and, and, uh, and uh, the spike vax, which are RNA vaccines, and then in comparison to the adenovirus vectored vaccine. And you can see that all of these vaccines, of course, do have adverse events. There is no denying of that. They are quite reactogenic. But then when we look into the more serious, uh, rare events, there are peculiarities to, to each one of those uh, concepts. And, and what has been uh, um, uh, surprising uh, was the myocarditis that was found, especially in the younger men and uh, uh, teenager uh, men, uh, that was typical of the RNA vaccines, whereas the uh, TTS, the thrombotic uh, thrombocytic uh, uh, cytomia, uh, was typical of the adenovirus vectored vaccines. So these again are, are again things that we need to remember when we are thinking about vaccine strategies, the benefits and the the harms that the vaccines may bring about. Now. Uh, we are already uh, uh, almost in the third year of, of the pandemic and, and of course most of us have met with the virus and that reflects in the, uh, in the uh, antibodies uh, and the seroprevalence. Uh, of uh, uh, our populations. I take here data from Finland from uh, last May, uh, which gives you the kind of uh, uh, age, uh, a dependency of the seroprevalence, very high in the young ones, lower in the older ones who were hiding at homes and not meeting anybody and not meeting the virus. And of course, this is data from May, thinking of what happened during the summer. Again, Omicron surges, uh, relaxing on the non-pharmaceutical measures. These seroprevalences today are much higher. And this does have implications again to our vaccine strategies. Uh, if we now look into the uh, systematic review done by Bobrovsky et al, that has looked into the hybrid immunity, meaning that uh, what is your response to the vaccine and what is your protection if you met the virus and then uh, got a vaccine or you got a vaccine and met the virus. And I think it's, it's very clear here, if you look in the upper panel, is the, um, the uh, symptomatic disease and infection. The lower one is the uh, severe disease. And you can see that if you you've only uh, met the infection, uh, you do get protection, but then if you have uh, met, the, uh, met the virus and ha uh, are vaccinated, then your uh, effectiveness against the serious disease is really high and lasts long. So again, we need to think, what does this mean? Most of our population is seropositive. What does it mean to our booster doses? Uh, what does it mean on, on the choice of the vaccine that we want to take? And again, we are very much uh, kind of uh, asking ourselves on, on uh, what data do we base our, our recommendation on if we want and when we want to be evidence-based in our decision making. So to guide the public health uh, uh, bodies uh, and countries in July and August, WHO Euro and ECDC and, and WHO say to recommended countries should consider a second booster dose, listing these people uh, risk groups. But there was no um, a recommendation at this point for, for uh, younger ones, children or younger adults. And that based very much on what we know of the seroprevalence and what we know the very good e efficacy effectiveness of uh, these vaccines against the serious disease. 
And uh, um, the, uh, also the advice was that these groups should not wait for the variant of uh, 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 adapted uh, vaccines, but uh, go ahead and, and uh, start uh, boosting even if they are not around. And in addition, WHO SAGE, where I have the privilege of, of serving as a member and chair of the COVID vaccination working group, uh, we said that the development of the pan-SARS-CoV-2 and pan sars virus vaccines, as well as vaccines with greater impact on virus transmission, meaning nasal vaccines or aerosol vaccines, is urgently needed, but the time frame for uh, their development is unclear. And why it's unclear is that we still don't fully understand the pathogenesis. We don't. Uh, we know that the spike protein is very good at uh, uh, preventing uh, serious disease, but we don't fully understand uh, the mucosal immunity and how to uh, probe that. But this is the uh, kind of a development plan on where we would like to see the uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccine development or sarbacovirus vaccine development, broader uh, uh, based immunity uh, so that we are better prepared also for the future uh, variants and uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, targeting uh, one uh, certain variant of concern because we always lose the game for that regardless of if we have the RNA vaccines at hand which are very fast to uh, maneuver um, uh, to, to target these new variants. And the fact is that the uh, virus evolution is very rapid. Uh, we've seen uh, that there are offsprings of pretty far uh, right now, we're living in the Omicron era, and on all the variants that we see uh, as, as the major variants actually stem from, the, from this Omicron brand. And uh, our vaccine development has been targeting against uh, that. But the WHO uh, uh, technical advisory group is really saying that we should be, rather than targeting these specific variants, target more broad-based. So the broad-based rather than target vaccines is, is the mantra that I keep hearing around uh, the vaccinologists and, and uh, our, our clinical developers that I, I talk with. But then there is an, um, another big, big world out there if we step out from the COVID field, and, and that is the, the entire pipeline that has now started flourishing. And those of you who don't know what to do in your life, please go and, and, and go to the vaccine, vaccine development, because uh, uh, the RNA uh, platform really provides us amazing opportunities. I've listed here uh, some of the uh, uh, biotech uh, companies and, and the uh, vaccine producers' websites where they tell their pipeline pipelines, and you can just see that it's a wealth of pathogens that people are working on right now. Some are already in the very uh, late uh, phases of development, uh, like the influenza and RSV and the second generation COVID vaccines. What we would want from those uh, uh, is, is that they are more um, uh, um, uh, heat stable, uh, that they don't need the minus 70 uh, uh, freezing cold chain because that's impossible for many uh, low middle and middle income countries. Also, uh, uh, the uh, second generation would hopefully target other other antigens beside the spike protein to maybe allow for more on the mucosal immunity. But then you can see on the right hand side, it's not just uh, pathogens, it's also cancer, it's also uh, uh, tissue injury, it's genetic uh, uh, malformations. All of this actually uh, is, is now flourishing as an, a very, very promising field of, of medicine that we can provide, uh, provide uh, um, more health uh, to the population and, and persons in general. So, uh, Mr. Chairs or, or moderators, I, I think I'll rest uh, my case here and, and uh, looking forward to any of your questions uh, that you might have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Hannah. We'll, uh, there are questions coming in for you, and, but we'll wait with them till the, okay. uh, till the plenary. So keep on uh, shooting questions. They're really interesting to read. And uh, now we welcome Cornelia to give us a completely uh, different perspective on these recent dramatic developments in the field. So Cornelia, please, uh, online. There Thank we are. Hi, so Cornelia. Much. Hi, hi, everyone in the room. Um, greetings from Germany. I'm happy that I can be with you online. Um, so indeed, we're actually now talking about something very different. So um, I'm going to talk about um, how to understand the cognitive and social dynamics of vaccination. And actually a question that we've discussed in the beginning 
was what is the impact of mRNA vaccines on vaccine complication? How do we prepare for the future? So this is what guided this preparation of the presentation. And I can give you a little spoiler. We, we don't really know causally because a lot happened during that pandemic. And uh, But I can also say that we do see changes in the psychological landscape around vaccination since the onset of the pandemic. And I would like to have a look at what these changes are and what the implications are for future vaccine communication. And I have lots of, lots of data from Germany, but I'm sure that we can transfer this to many countries as well. So if we want to know what changed, we probably have to take a look back to um, where was vaccine uptake before the pandemic. And it was actually a quite nice development because for childhood vaccinations, for example, we saw an increase over the years. And with the pandemic, there was a, a first a decrease since a couple of years or actually two decades. And um, so UNICEF and WHO actually um, a warning that we're seeing this and the reasons of course can be manifold. We have less NGOs um, who work during the pandemic, access was more difficult and maybe people had, had fear of contracting the disease when they go to the doctor's office. But there of course can also be psychological reasons and I'd like to look at a couple of them. So um, there are a couple of reasons that we um, frequently find that are relevant for vaccine intentions and behavior. First, people look at the risk. Do, do they feel at risk from the disease? Um, do they, are they confident uh, that the vaccine will be safe and effective? Um, can they actually access the um, the vaccine and are they aware and I will talk a little bit about this that the vaccine has positive benefits for others at least most of the vaccines and I think that's one of the problems we saw during the pandemic and they have a certain uh, wish for calculating the risks and benefits some people are quite prone to um, doing this and most of the people who are high in calculation when we measure all of these um, indicators are actually less willing to get vaccinated. So if you look at these four, uh, five, um, five reasons for getting vaccinated or not vaccinated from and compare them from the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020 to November 2022, we see changes in nearly every indicator. So I think one of the most striking is there are people are less, less confident that vaccines are safe. Um, they are more complacent. And I think that's interesting because they actually saw what a pandemic can do, what diseases can do. And still, they are not so convinced that vaccines are necessary to prevent um, diseases. And the number of people who are keen to do like a risk benefit calculation for vaccines in general is increased. So um, what we see is that we, we have a little bit more people who have questions. And this is also when we look at a, a question that is taken, that is posed by one of our health agencies in Germany. So in general, are you in favor of vaccination or opposed to vaccination and, or something in between? We saw over the last years, if you look at the right graph, the green one, the dark green, um, was the increasing number of people who said, yes, I'm in favor of vaccination. So before the pandemic, it was like nearly 60% who said, yes, I'm totally in favor of vaccines. And um, so this is how, how we started in July 20. And um, as in November 2022, it's only with 40, it's only 40% who say, yes, I'm in favor of vaccination. And the part in the middle who are rather in favor or partly opposed or partly in favor, who have questions has actually increased. So I think the landscape has changed to be more difficult for vaccine communication, more people with questions, more uh, less unconditional acceptors of vaccination. So when we look back um, at the time when it started um, in November 2020, 20, um, before the vaccines were actually approved, most of the people didn't know which technology the vac new vac vaccines were. So they were kind of a 
tabula rasa, like a blank um, blank screen, and didn't know much about vaccine types. Just a small part of the people knew about it. And then vaccines were approved, and there was lots of media discussion around what type the, these vaccines are, and there were lots of, of course, misinformation also about whether the vaccine can actually alter your DNA. I think this was seen in all countries. And over time, there was kind of a skepticism that developed towards these types of vaccines. As in December 21, we saw that um, the unvaccinated people um, thought that the mRNA vaccines are very, were quite dangerous. So they had less, con less confidence in this type of vaccines as compared to more traditionally produced vaccines against COVID. So I think there were, uh, it was uh, actually, um, it was a great need for information and um, lots of misinformation could take place, uh, could um, find knowledge gaps um, and especially in the unvaccinated people, these mRNA vaccines created some doubts in the safety. So safety is one issue. And the other thing that is important for people is that vaccines can actually protect others. So this is something that has well been increasingly important over the last, let's say, 10 years um, in vaccine communication. And uh, people were increasingly educated about herd immunity and knowing about this makes vaccination a pro-social decision. I can do something good for myself and I can do something good for others as well. And of course, for herd immunity to happen, we need a vaccine that protects also from transmission. And there were actually great hopes that the COVID vaccine would do so as well. We saw this in, uh, before the vaccine was actually um, rolled out in December 20, we asked people, do you expect that it prevents transmission? And um, would you like to have it? And people who were, who were convinced or who thought it could prevent transmission had a more, were more likely um, it, or had a higher vaccination intention than the others. But there was a lot, a lot of uncertainty around it, as you can see, like 60 something percent um, were actually unsure or thought it would not prevent transmission. So this was something um, it, w which was really hoped for and uh, which actually also affected policy decisions. Um, so the rec it became quite clear in many countries that recommendations alone did not produce enough uptake. So there were um, kind of herd immunity thresholds communicated and then uh, health organizations refrained from doing so when it became clear that transmission was not reduced as it was hoped for. But still some countries discussed, for example, whether vaccination should be mandatory to reach uh, thresholds or to protect more people. And um, so some scholars and even the Pope <laughs> agreed that um, if there is no illegal mandate, it should be at least a moral obligation. And this is, um, so if you look at moral morality as cooperation theory um, in psychology, um, cooperation is morally good. And if you don't cooperate, um, this is morally bad. So if you can protect others, you should do so. And so this put some twist to the vaccination communication and to, uh, to, the, to how the society deals with it. Um, what we saw is that the debate actually got quite hot. Um, when we asked vaccinated and unvaccinated people, how do you feel about the debate? A lot of the unvaccinated people found it quite unfair, um, quite, quite morally disrespectful. And um, they said, I'm being discriminated against in my, in my everyday life. And one thing that we found is that people were quite identified with being vaccinated. So the unvaccinated said, I'm quite proud to be unvaccinated. And the vaccinated said, I'm proud to be vaccinated. So we had two groups that were proud of their vaccination status. And what you can see on the right graph here is um, if, the un if the unvaccinated um, 
were um, were quite proud of their status, they had a different perception of the uh, of being discriminated against. So, is it just a feeling, or was it something real? So, we we tried to find an answer to this by running an experiment where people had to share money between themselves and other people. And we varied whether the other person was vaccinated or unvaccinated. And what we find is that vaccinated people gave other vaccinated people a lot more money than unvaccinated people. So in fact, the unvaccinated didn't only feel discriminated against, actually they were discriminated against. And this has to do with the social contract so if you can protect others, you should do it. And if you contribute to that social contract, you're, you dislike others who are not contributing to the social contract and you try to punish them either socially or here in this case with money. And we, what we saw in the studies is that the more you identify with your status, um, with your vaccination status, the more you discriminate between the two groups. Let me say that the unvaccinated to do the same, but the effect was stronger for the vaccinated. So vaccination became something which was part, which is part of our identity, and this has been this has been discussed discussed before the pandemic already. However, now in the pandemic, I think it makes it more difficult. Um, to change vaccination attitudes just with communication because it's so strong because it's part of your identity. And I mean, if we look also what Hannah just said, the challenge with the current vaccines is they have only protection against severe disease. I mean, which is great, but for the communication regarding herd immunity and community uh, protection, this of course is a very difficult thing because it affects the willingness to, vac to get vaccinated if you cannot protect others. And um, one consequence this has is that it, the fact that you cannot be protected by others is that you should definitely get vaccinated yourself. So we actually need more people to get vaccinated to have a good overall protection. So the changes that we see in the landscape is that we, I think people learned a lot about vaccination, about herd immunity, um, the good and the bad sides of herd immunity, right? So you can protect others, but you can also free ride. Um, and um, that this hope was actually not coming true. And um, people identified with being vaccinated quite strongly and it became part of um, social conflicts. We have more fencers and more people with questions now. And I think health communication and vaccine education um, is will get more difficult um, in the future because all of this has changed. And vaccination is was a no-brainer for many people before. However, now we have less people for whom vaccination is a no-brainer. So we might wonder, would, wouldn't it be nice to know this in the process while, while we're during the pandemic? And yes, I think it would be great and it would be definitely necessary to build more systems, structures where we can have um, the public attitudes, the public thinking and feeling around vaccination mixed um, with uh, or like assess data about their feeling and thinking and make it available to policymakers and communicators. I think that's so necessary to um, steer the process and not to be surprised at the end of this pandemic, but um, to be able to react um, to um, to all what happens in people's perceptions around vaccines. So, what if we what if we have more mRNA vaccines in the future, and if this technology actually means no or less reduction of transmission or less herd immunity? What what are the implications? Um, so I said, if we can protect others, vaccination is a social contract. And if there is no such protection of others, vaccination will be less of a pro-social behavior. The herd immunity argument cannot be used in vaccine communication anymore. 
And the positive side, if everybody understands this, is that it could lead to less conflicts and less polarization because we don't need to identify with this um, so much anymore because vaccination is more of an individual thing not such a, and not such a social thing anymore. And um, for this, however, it will be very relevant to have very good health communication that enables people to make good vaccination decisions. And I think we're in a difficult situation now because people have more questions, misinformation is in the world, and trust in vaccination um, declined a little bit. So health workers will have a very, very um, important role in this process. So I think it's very important to take the momentum and the lessons to be learned from this um, to improve vaccination in the future. So thank you for your attention. Uh, many thanks, Cornelia, and there's a number of questions, but we will uh, postpone it uh, to the uh, discussion at the end. Uh, so now I would like to uh, ask Jeremy to take floor, and um, this will be uh, our third perspective uh, to, to focus more on uh, administrative tools such as certificates. Please, Jeremy. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to reflect a little bit on the French experience with COVID-19 vaccination. So I'm really going to focus on the French case and because discussing national cases helps understand how various factors mix together. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, all right. As you may know, COVID-19 emerged at a complicated moment for France, uh, for vaccination in France. Um, in France, uh, attitudes to vaccines have seriously deteriorated after the 2009 pandemic flu uh, vaccination campaign. And this recent history seems, um, oops, sorry, and you can see it in international comparisons of attitudes to vaccines. I'm thinking here, um, of course, um, Heidi Larson's um, observation of uh, international attitudes towards vaccines, which found both in 2016 and 2018 that the share of people who have doubts regarding the safety of vaccines was much higher in France than in most countries they, they surveyed. And this recent history seems to have affected attitudes towards COVID-19 vaccines and even before these vaccines were available. So here um, we, we gathered with colleagues all the um, uh, surveys available on intentions to vaccinate against COVID-19 from the beginning of the pandemic uh, up to um, the, um, the health pass was put in place in, in July 2021. And what you see is right from the start, you had around 25% of the French public, um, of the French adult population, who did not intend to vaccinate, which is a much higher share than in most uh, neighboring countries. And, but we also see that there was a sharp decrease of this uh, of, of intentions to vaccinate all the way till the beginning of the vaccination campaign and then it improved uh, progressively and the reasons behind this initial re reticence towards um, COVID-19 vaccines were the same as the ones we saw in 2009 regarding the H1N1 pandemic flu uh, vaccine. They mainly revolved around the idea that um, these vaccines were brand new and the speed at which they were produced uh, the, um, meant that they hadn't been tested enough. Uh, well, basically the idea that because of all this novelty, because they were rushed, they would not be safe. And um, so that's what we found when we conducted surveys and asked people why they didn't, didn't want to be vaccinated. And when you look at public discourses, public criticism of these vaccines before the vaccination campaign started, they tended to focus on the mRNA technology, which tended to um, exemplify this newness of these vaccines. Um, and when I'm talking about public discourses, I'm talking about uh, the uh, uh, dis discourse produced by uh, vaccine critics on their websites, but also in the instances where the debate over vaccine safety emerged in the mainstream media, it tended to focus on mRNA vaccines. And um, this, uh, and they also, tend, well, one of the reasons for these doubts was that they were also connected to GMOs, and GMOs are very unpopular in France. Um, but as we can see on this graph, uh, we nevertheless saw a very strong improvement of intentions to vaccinate and mRNA vaccines did not hinder this trend. 
On the contrary, they were one of the reasons why we saw such improvement. Indeed, as the vaccination campaign unfolded, the media continuously commented upon the various studies showing that mRNA vaccines were more effective against COVID-19 than other vaccines and were still effective despite the emergence of new variants. And that was a major object of concern uh, at the beginning of the vaccination campaign in France. And their safety was also very favorably presented in the media, especially after March 2020. One uh, and the uh, events around the AstraZeneca vaccine. And um, so after that, the French government, government focused almost exclusively on mRNA vaccination to, to the point that rapidly they became more or less the only vaccines available. And uh, so rapidly, rapidly, mRNA vaccines actually became the more trusted vaccines rather than uh, the, the least trusted vaccines. So here, for instance, you can see the results of a, of a survey we conducted with a few colleagues where we asked the respondents to assess the efficacy and the safety of the four vaccines that were available in France at that moment. And we can see that um, vaccines based on the mRNA technology fared much better than the other ones. And, and actually, it makes sense. We mustn't forget that attitudes to vaccines are not formed completely inde independently of the scientific reality of these vaccines and the reality and the, of the efficacy and safety um, of mRNA vaccines became uh, more, uh, more and more undisputed as the uh, vaccination campaign unfold unfolded. And they were important determinants of attitudes to vaccines. As more became known about these vaccines, many became more convinced that they were safe and effective and vice versa. Um, and I mean, vice versa. Similarly, hesitancy spans from, often spans from the very real limitations of vaccines. So for instance, today in France, one remaining source of reticence is the very real limitation that was well underlined this morning of these, vac of these vaccines' ability to prevent transmission, uh, to prevent transmission. And, but this improvement in, uh, in intentions to vaccinate was also allowed by the fact that political debates very quickly moved away from the issue of uh, vaccine safety. Basically in France, since very early in the pandemic, um, the, everything pertaining to the pandemic became very politicized, especially in, in public debates, but also whenever you ask people you know, what they thought about anything relative to the pandemic, you saw that political attitudes were very strong determinants. Um, and it was very, and it was the case very early uh, for vaccination. So here it's the same data as before, but we passed it depending on, uh, but we calculated uh, the differences um, depending on whether, well, which party people felt closest to. And we can see that across the whole period, people who felt closest to parties on the far left and the far right, and that's like one of the biggest groups of, of, uh, of people in France, uh, tended to have much lower intentions to vaccinate than people who voted for parties at the center, at the right and the left. And, but, and it kind of makes sense because very early in the, in the uh, well, just before the vaccination campaign started and at the beginning of the vaccination campaign, um, main, the main uh, figures of these parties expressed their doubts towards uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety and they te also tended to focus on the mRNA technology. But these results are also quite surprising because this only lasted for a few weeks. Very quickly, these parties completely abandoned the issue of vaccine safety to focus on the organization of the vaccine campaign and later the health pass, but we'll get to that in a, in a minute. So mRNA vaccines rapidly convinced most French people, or at least convinced them enough for them to intend to vaccinate. But the, va but the mRNA technology posed other, issue, other issues, which relate to access and outreach programs. And these, these issues, became particularly visible after the health pass was put in place and we had a high vaccination coverage overall, but the uh, places where we had low vaccination coverage really appeared. Um, basically, from the beginning, well, very early in the vaccination campaign, the public authorities made great efforts to make vaccines widely available, mainly by making them free of charge and by organizing big vaccination centers so that uh, to ramp up vaccination capacities. And, uh, and this 
uh, meant that uh, we saw a quick progression of the vaccine coverage. And when you look at overall numbers, uh, France became you know, one of the best vaccinated countries very quickly. But even at the beginning of the vaccination campaign, experts and uh, w especially those working with more marginalized groups warned that actually many of the most at-risk populations were lagging behind when it came to vaccination. And you can, act and, and, and you can see it, for instance, in this graph, which uh, represents uh, age groups, with a low, well, relatively low vaccination coverage for people aged over 80, main, many of which, of which are isolated in France. But you can also see these discrepancies um, when you look at, for, for instance, so it's the graph to the left, homeless people or people who have had uh, experience with homelessness. And this is a um, Roderer study, large scale study amongst um, people, homeless people in France. And they showed that even after the health pass was put in place, homeless people had a very low vaccination coverage compared to uh, the overall population. And to the right, um, you have a study by uh, Florence Debar, uh, who shows that um, it's also the case, not as, uh, I mean, the differences are not as uh, striking, but they're still pretty striking uh, when you uh, take into consideration uh, unemployment and, and, the, um, and immigration. And um, so much of these discrepancies can be, and uh, more importantly, these discrepancies remained if, even after the health pass was put in place. The health pass didn't manage to uh, solve these issues. And these discrepancies, they can be explained by difficulties in access to the healthcare system, as well as one of its main correlates, a distrust in that system. But it is also important to note that some practical aspects of uh, mRNA vaccines made it more difficult for local actors to compensate for these structural trends the multi-dose packaging, and more importantly, the fact that vaccines had to be stored in low temperature freezers. So all this meant that um, any outreach action needed more planning and bigger target populations. It also meant that uh, many of them meant taking people to vaccination centers rather than bringing vaccines to them. And we know that any opportunity to vaccinate can add up, especially when you're working with uh, the more uh, marginalized group. And more, more importantly, this meant that any outreach action implied more time, more effort, more money. And, uh, and, and um, this was not compensated by a state funding uh, to support these local uh, interventions. But I also really want to insist on the importance of planning. Planning is really a crucial problem when you are dealing with people living in the most precarious situations. So, um, so that makes it difficult with mRNA vaccines. So what should we you know, start concluding from all that? Well, three main things, and I'm going to develop a little bit afterwards. Firstly, the relationship between mRNA vaccines and hesitancy is very complicated and evolves as mRNA technology evolves and the COVID epidemic evolves. Secondly, we often pay too little attention to the technical aspects of outreach programs and how they are constrained by the technology itself. And thirdly, well, thinking about health pass, uh, the health pass, you need more than one tool to reach high vaccine coverage. So firstly, the mRNA vaccines actually helped limit vaccine hesitancy by proving they were effective and safe, but at the same time, not entirely, because they have a limited ability to uh, prevent transmission and the efficacy against uh, infection also decreases relatively rapidly. And that's important when most of your population doesn't feel particularly at risk of developing a se severe form of COVID. And you can see it today, for instance, with the data I'm, I'm presenting here, which is the coverage for booster doses. There is still a great you know, reluctance to get a booster dose. And uh, while many people got the booster dose when it was still part of the health pass until February, we have seen a stagnation of uh, the share of the population who had the booster dose. Secondly, the health pass has enabled to obtain pretty good vaccination coverage rates. But as we can see in this data, they hide the fact that many are only getting vaccinated because they are constrained into doing so. 
So let me give you another example. We conducted a survey in, uh, in September 2021, so two months after the health pass was announced. And we asked people whether they still had doubts regarding the vaccine they had when they got vaccinated, whether they were angry and whether they regretted being vaccinated. And as we can see, so the people who got vaccinated after the health pass was put in place, most of them still had important doubts towards the vaccines and the share of the people with negative attitudes to vaccines among the vaccinated rose really sharply. And um, so, the sh so many of them were vaccinated despite being still reluctant to do so. So let's end by looking a bit forward. The situation in France after this first phase of the acute epidemic of COVID-19 is not one of renewed trust and hope in vaccines. Um, here, let me present quite depressing results from a survey we conducted this, uh, this summer in August, where we asked people you know, questions on their, how they felt about many of the policies relative to vaccination in France, but also communication. I won't you know, comment all of them, but we can see a very important distrust and dissatisfaction at the communication and decisions made around uh, vaccination. And the explanation crosses multiple factors, um, including a structural distrust of political elites, and so that's you know, structural for the past at least 30 years, and during COVID-19, important failings in the public communication around COVID-19 vaccination. So to conclude, high vaccination coverages are reached when vaccines fade in the background. When they are basically when they're not part of public discussion, when vaccines, you know, are depoliticized and routinized, when they, when they are part of, of everyday life and daily activities and the normal passing of seasons and years, when they are performed by your local you know, uh, healthcare professional that you also see for many other, for many other um, issues you might have. Large vaccination centers, irregular announcements by, in the media by members of, uh, of the government and political actors on both sides, well, all of that is the opposite of routinization. So the issue now is the routinization of COVID-19 vaccination will, of course, depend on the design of public policies and the nature of public debates, but it will also depend on how the technology evolves and how easy it makes it to uh, make these vaccines routinized, routine. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for this uh, uh, great overview. And I think we are in a good place to start our uh, plenary discussion. And uh, we would like to ask uh, to show the results of the poll from before the presentations. Uh, if we may bring this up now. Oh, oh? OK. So the question was. Uh, <laughs> oh. Oh, no, it's not that one. <laughs> I thought it was quite the, optimistic. Yes. <laughs> this is the wrong poll? Yes, yeah. this is the poll from yesterday. Okay, okay, excellent. So, um, um, would you, maybe we can take uh, some uh, questions that, uh, then from the audience while we are waiting for, for the, the poll from, um, from the beginning. I will, I will sit down, we all sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still, there are many questions coming in and uh, that have come in, but please continue to send them. So uh, that's great. So thank you very much for all these lovely presentations. And I think, um, I think I'll start with, there, there are quite a few questions. Um, but there's one here for Cornelia, for starters, uh, and I think it may be s something that's relevant for all of you to answer, but <clears throat> what more needs to be done in peacetime in order to sensitize population groups to emerging technologies in the vaccine world to gain better acceptance during the large-scale vaccination phase? Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. And H Hannah also already talked about the nasal vaccines and that there might have some benefits regarding re reduction of transmission. So there might be something new for most of the population. So um, I think it's really important to prepare for this already. And I think one of the most important groups for this are healthcare workers. 
um, they need information as well. I think this is something that tends to be, you know, not maybe not forgotten, but I think it needs to be emphasized more. They need good inf sources of information that they can share with the patients and they need good information themselves. So I think this could be a way forward to be proactive in, in educating health workers as multipliers and the most trusted source of information. Thank you very much. Any one of the, the panel wants to come further on that? Well, during the pandemic, we've seen that everybody's become an epidemiologist and maybe there is a time in peacetime that everybody becomes a vaccinologist and I would start from the kids in the school so that uh, uh, there is better uh, reading ability on science. And uh, as, as, as far as I agree with, uh, with Cornelia, that healthcare workers are important, they're a trusted source. But the, I, I think we all own these matters and, and I would like to see these being discussed more uh, as, as widely uh, as now, maybe not as politically but um, take an ownership, a kind of a community and, and society ownership of these issues. Thank you. I think uh, another poll is ready. Should we try yes. to see it? Uh, okay, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's look at uh, what uh, US the audience think about uh, whether the mRNA vaccines will actually increase or decrease the public acceptance and I uh, the, the, most, uh, the, the most popular answer was it will not affect, which is 41% uh, and then a little bit less that it will decrease actually uh, public acceptance. So, so I would like to maybe start with uh, Jeremy to comment on, uh, yeah. on the results of the poll. Um, I'm not completely surprised. Um, and I think, so, well, maybe my perspective is too centered on the, the French case, but what we see is that the issue of novelty is always an issue when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. And you can see basically the same arguments being, you know, copy paste and changed, and you change what new means. So for instance, I did my PhD on the H1N1 flu vaccination campaign, and here it was, you know, new vaccine completely new just because it wasn't labeled as you know the flu vaccine and then it became um, the new aluminum based adjuvants well they weren't, weren't completely new in the 2010s but it's new 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 and and we've had big debates over whether um, providing other vaccines uh, that are not mRNA vaccines would help vaccinate the last 6% who are not vaccinated in France. And so we, you know, authorized other ones. It's a fail, complete fail. We gained one point in vaccination, but not even with those vaccines in particular. Would uh, uh, Hannah or Cornelia? Well, I, I, I would agree that uh, um, this is probably what we would also see in Finland and many other countries. There are those people who are concerned. And as scientists, we are also concerned. I think we need to be critical when we have new technology. We need to keep on studying and, and finding issues and, and um, rare events. Uh, uh, we did capture the myocarditis. I hope there is nothing yeah. else as... as, uh, uh, yeah, as <laughs> uh, um, uh, severe, but uh, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with new technology, things may happen and, and you need to be transparent about it and set up systems so that you study it and understand it. Yeah. I, I myself was a bit surprised to see such a big proportion uh, saying that it will decrease the public acceptance, I must say, mm -hmm. despite all those concerns. And Cornelia, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, thanks. I think, as I said in my, in my talk, there we have some numbers from Germany now and there are more people who have questions and I think they're not well refusing vaccines but they learned a lot about vaccines and this creates a lot of questions about effectiveness about protection of others technologies etc and it might also spill over to to the childhood vaccines or other vaccines so I think it's it's good to prepare that people might have more questions than before so I think this is one of the outcomes and now we should really think about how we can learn, how we can turn this increased knowledge also into more demand for vaccination. Okay, thank you. And uh, this, this, this brings me a little bit to our uh, next topic for our discussions, uh, which is uh, about the challenges uh, for the future and uh, what would you think um, and also what would the audience think about uh, 
what are the biggest challenges uh, for, for the vaccination pro uh, programs uh, in view of the new developments? And uh, I would like to reference to some questions maybe as well that came from the audience in the topic that you, you could uh, also comment. Uh, for example, uh, how do we ensure equity um, both in development so that we uh, not only develop uh, vaccine against the diseases that are common and are likely to bring a lot of income for the uh, manufacturers, but also for other diseases. How do we cover, cover all of it? Um, how do we... <clears throat> And let me look uh, for another one. Um, yes, uh, uh, challenges around communications are a huge challenge. And uh, so how, how do we decrease the polarization between uh, the, the, the vaccinated and unvaccinated? Um, how do we uh, communicate uh, given um, the, the, the little effect on transmission? Do we need to change it? in view of uh, social contract. So uh, I would uh, probably ask maybe Hannah to comment first yeah. on the greatest challenges. This is a huge question, thanks. Yes. <laughs> we could spend the whole day on, around it. But I, I, if, I, if I put my global hat on, then I think the uh, inequality is, is quite obvious. It's with the COVID vaccines, but it's with other vaccines. I mean, COVID, um, I, I didn't bring a slide, but there is a very nice slide where you can see on how many years it took for the different uh, uh, epi vaccines to come into the program. It was over 20 years for something like hepatitis B to reach 60% coverage globally. So with the COVID, it went up like this. But with other vaccines, it's really been a very slow slope. And I, I think we should be doing better that the vaccines that we have, which are good and safe vaccines, that they should be more equally available in the world. That's number one. Then the number two is, is, is uh, the same applies to our countries, that there are excellent vaccines already, which we know that are safe and efficacious. However, the money is the concern. That if you look into the vaccines, we tend to be in our own box. And, you know, we can buy Hornet planes and we can do all sorts of uh, build uh, uh, these roads and other things. Nobody questions, you know, their cost effectiveness. Whereas with the vaccines, the question is always on, is this uh, sufficiently cost efficacious? And, and then uh, um, sometimes it seems to me that we're too prudent in that. I agree we should do cost effectiveness. There should be a health return uh, to the money that we put into the vaccines. But then I think we should also at the same time jump out of this box and think of, of vaccinations as health security in the global picture. Mm. And um, I guess if I, if I put those two things there, maybe, yes. uh, maybe uh, Jeremy or, or Cornelia can, yes. can continue. Well, I'm very happy that you talked about this, so I don't have to say it. I was going to say, you know, equity is, is the main, main issue. I think looking, well, if you look at uh, more developed countries, one of the crucial issues is going to be the fact that many of the vaccines that are under development and that are looking good, you know, we, are f we can be confident that they arrive, they're against diseases that are not well known by the public and not you know, very feared. And that's one of the issues we've had before with HPV vaccination. That's what it's the issue we had with the pandemic flu vaccination. The flu is not important. Uh, it's an issue we've had with COVID-19 vaccination. You know, who dies from COVID? Well, actually many people, but yeah, in France, most people didn't feel at risk of COVID-19. And when you roll out these new vaccines that are not necessarily for diseases that are previously well known, well, it's very likely that you'll have hesitancy. So I think that's one of the issues. How do you sensitize the public to uh, the real risk of each, uh, each disease when they don't know about it before? Okay. And uh, Cornelia, would you also like to name what are the biggest challenges according to you? Well, um, one of the questions that you read also pertain to the question, should we now teach people about that missing lack of transmission, uh, protection against transmission? And I think this is a very difficult question because it's, I mean, it's very um, connected to a certain type of vaccines and it it's, so for other vaccines, we can count on um herd immunity or community immunities. And this was a very strong argument before. But in Germany, for example, we see some uh, public discussion about it or in certain um, bubbles, 
that it was oversold, that it was too much stress that it could protect others. And I think that's, um, well, a very, um, it's a very difficult debate because it could, you know, it could really damage the idea that people have in their minds about vaccination, but still they should be educated about this. And um, so I think this is a great challenge um, that is ahead of us. Um, especially if we get more vaccines that are based on that technology and that also have this feature of um, of not preventing transmission. Okay, thank you. There, there are several, there are many questions here, and many of them um, uh, pertain a bit to the uh, polarization in the population in terms of attitudes of vaccination. How do you have any strategies in how to reduce this uh, polarization? Is one of the questions, and also uh, the other thing that comes out is the marginalized and vulnerable populations. Do you have any good uh, strategies for that as well? How how can we reach these populations now that we go forward? Uh, I think this could be uh, first to you, Jeremy, perhaps. Well, I'm sure Cornelia has a, a lot to say about that too. I think so. so. I'll, I'll try and be as short as I'm able to. Um, I think in many ways the two issues can be um, connected through the issue of trust and access to in public institutions, including the healthcare system. In France, for instance, when you look at it, um, it seems like there's a political polarization, that's the data I presented. But when you have finer data, what you see is that a lot of it is not necessarily the fact that, you know, politicians said something about vaccines, because actually most people don't listen to politicians. But the issue is the trust, and the trust that you have in public policies, and, uh, and you know, public actors, and the capacity of the state to regulate, to regulate important things. And what you see with the most marginalized population is both they both have little access and tendency uh, to go towards the healthcare system, but they also have a, an enormous distrust in healthcare workers and public actors. So in many ways, one of the ways to improve um, uh, that is to make sure that the healthcare system and more generally public institutions are more connected to the people and feel less remote uh, and feel less remote. Okay, thank you. Should we take uh, Hannah first? Then? Well, I, I wouldn't uh, talk about the marginalists. I would want to bring the kind of a polarization mm. if we can take that one right now. So uh, what has happened uh, during the con uh, pandemic time is, is that everything has become very much politicized. And I think during these times, it's so important that us epidemiologists and vaccinologists that we stick to data and it's the data sources that really we need to pay attention to and, and be sure that we have high quality data that is accurate and it's timely. And so that we can, uh, uh, what I showed you, the vaccine effectiveness figures, those are, uh, um, you cannot do that everywhere, but I, I wish we could do that everywhere, that we had good registers, that we could actually calculate the vaccine effectiveness figures as well as do the safety studies as they arise, as we did. But then, you need to uh, guide your uh, strategies. You need to change your strategies uh, as you go along. And the data tells you that now, what, like what Cornelia was saying about the herd immunity, we were riding a lot with that. But when we saw uh, that uh, uh, the vaccine did not prevent so much uh, that uh, infection and transmission, then you need to start thinking, is your strategy written in the, in the style that today's data supports? And here we've seen the polarization, especially among those politicians who've been riding on that herd immunity. And then they don't want to accept this new data, but they push with their agenda, whether the agenda is due to the election next March or whether it's due to their own popularity, they want to become a mayor somewhere. And, and it's so important that we uh, specialists and researchers remain intact on defending our data, defending our analysis, and, and find ways to report uh, back. In Finland, this has uh, um, actually uh, created a lot of uh, media uh, uh, clashes. Uh, physicians have had to fight in media, fight against the Minister of Health. And I don't think this is very healthy. I mean, it's something that we should... Uh, um, it's, it becomes personalized, it's not very healthy, and this feeds into vaccine hesitancy when the uh, citizens don't understand what's going on and why people are reading the data and the results in such a different manner. 
but I don't have a final solution to it. It's just that uh, I would uh, imagine that this is not the last time that's going to happen. Mm. Thank you. And uh, Cornelia, the, the final solution, please. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I probably disappoint point you. I think Jeremy and Hannah said something very important because in that pandemic we're in a situation where lots of the communication around vaccination is political communication and not health communication and I think this messes up very important things because of course politicians have to justify their decisions, have to say why they're um, doing any regulation or rules. However, it's so important that we have independent health communication and in some countries this didn't work out particularly well um, because we have lots of communication concentrated at the Minister of Health or um, um, the political sector. And I think this really leaves lots of people behind because what we also saw in the pandemic, that trust in the government decreased in some countries. It's, I mean, it's a very long crisis and it's probably a natural thing that trust is quite stressed over such a long time. And so if you really have only political communication, then um, you'll lose uh, many people um, regarding new updates. And I think this is sci scientists speaking about data. I think that's very important, but this is not the only thing we need. We also need independent health communication agencies and structures. Um, that try to reach everyone and, and this is also to do with the equity. One of the things with polarization, I think what Jeremy said, making it very natural that you're vaccinated, that is something normal and that is not, you know, that keeps this, that tries to reduce the importance for your identity. I think this is something very important and this is probably something natural that is going to happen over time when there aren't any regulation that separates vaccinated and unvaccinated people from, I don't know, going to concerts or restaurants, for example. These regulations probably also contributed to the strong um, well, to the strong sense of um, well, putting vaccination into your uh, as part of your identity. So I think as everything gets more normal and getting vaccinated is, um, well, again, more normal. I think this should help in reducing the polarization, hopefully. Would you like to go? Uh, yeah, just a, I just wanted to add something on that. One issue we have is how do we uh, prevent vaccines from being part of, you know, political debates, as in how do we prevent uh, uh, different political parties just using vaccination to show that they're different from each other. In France, this was the case before, you know, 2015, 2016, and now it's a bit less the case, but I have no idea how we do that. And it poses the question of the politicization of health. Uh, there are some things that we can do, but there are many things that really depend on how politics is done today and it's done very differently here and there and uh, I don't have answers on that but I think it's important. I think but these are all very difficult questions. I have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have also one question because there is this uh, like system in this chat so there is a question that got a lot of likes and I think I will address it to you Hannah. Um, and the question is regarding uh, the future of uh, COVID vaccines, whether they are likely to become regularly recommended uh, for the whole population just the way the influenza vaccine is. Do you, could you comment what are the, the possible discussions and, and future plans for recommending this as a regular vaccine? Very important question, and, and I think all governments and, and researchers are, are working on this right now. The simple answer is that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. We keep uh, 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 scanning what happens with the virus. If the virus remains as, as uh, 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 vigilant uh, and circulating uh, and, and e e evading uh, immunity, it will be sure that some people will need boosters, uh, those who are uh, in risk groups and, and vulnerable. But whether healthy and younger people need boosters, I think that's a still an unsolved uh, answer. 
and, and right now we are sitting back and, and looking into the different measures. If the measure is preventing serious disease, then certainly uh, um, uh, the protection that we now have for those uh, age groups is sufficient. But uh, if the virus evolves to a more pathogenic uh, one, then it's time to re-engineer uh, the vaccine and, and go for more boosters for more people. So we, we simply are not there yet. Okay, many thanks. I think it will be a challenge for all of us in public health to make those decisions. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of the session. So I think, Adam, would you like to uh, summarize a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a broad discussion to summarize, um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's an amazing uh, development and I think uh, looking also forward at what, uh, uh, what we have ahead of us, it's quite uh, fantastic in terms of the uh, challenges that we stand for this, uh, in, uh, that we have to meet, but also the opportunities in a sense with, with these new types of vaccines that may be coming out and the long list and the, the of uh, techniques that we will have to address in some way and, and that we all can become uh, vaccine uh, uh, producers or the manufacturers, that sounds very hopeful. But uh, it, it gives really hope, I think, to us that we, uh, that we could get these uh, more vaccines uh, into the system and addressing more uh, public health issues. I think that's one of the messages I, I take with me from this. The other one is the uh, incredible big um, uh, change that, that, that has happened. Uh, it, it, it's a bit worrying seeing the politicization and, uh, and the polarization uh, of the debate and hoping that we, uh, we, we also have learned something. We learned yesterday that we are not keen to learn lessons, but I think indeed here as well, we need to learn some and we need to move on uh, in, in how we address this, uh, these issues. So um, to me, uh, that's one of the bigger uh, messages as well, that we saw that the, 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 pop the amount of the population that have more questions now, that our, our, our hesitance has actually increased through this, uh, this time. Perhaps not so surprising, but also an, an important message, I think, uh, that we need to address. So um, would you like to say something more, Magda, before we thank our speakers? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think we didn't really have enough time to, uh, to discuss the perspectives ahead of mRNA vaccines uh, also for other diseases. And I think this is going to be an important issue in the future as well. Uh, and also uh, the, the new developments in terms of technologies and how to better address the, the, the current drawbacks such as cold, uh, cold, uh, cold temperatures. So, um, and um, Yes, and I think we didn't uh, also have enough time to discuss the social contract and its uh, implications uh, to a great extent. Uh, so I think uh, we, uh, we have to bring these discussions to the, um, to the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with this, uh, I um, think I would like to uh, thank for the great presentations and great contributions to our uh, speakers and, and the, the, and the culture. Uh, and um, yeah, I think this is a great uh, um, first session of the day and, and uh, we can con uh, continue discussing all the topics. And Jackie, would you like to thank intervene as well? Thank you very much well? indeed. And thank you to you, Magdalena. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to all our speakers.